Oh, I love the towel. That's awesome. Good stuff. <laughs> and uh, Colby's got the hat. <laughs> awesome. And Candace has this, the world championship spirit. So <laughs> yes, <laughs> I oh, didn't my. know there was a dress code. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's a Friday night. Uh, first, I want to welcome Ted back. We've missed Ted over these last few weeks on our evidence-based triathlete podcast. So welcome back, Ted. Thank you very much. I'm so excited to be back. Um, you know, we didn't really talk too much about it, but I had some medical issues going on and um, I'm, I'm getting better and uh, excited to be back doing the evidence-based uh, triathlon podcast with you. I definitely, I definitely missed it, but I just absolutely couldn't have done it the last month. But uh, I, I appreciate you uh, and and having the guest hosts on. And um, so yeah, let's 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 get back at it and get it get, get it going for the fall. Well, and this is a great way to sort of get back. And and uh, we've got a Lati World Champion seventy point three World Championship recap that both Ted and I were supposed to be at, but boy, we, we had to miss it for different reasons. And I tell you what, I am, I, as much as I wanted to be there suffering with you on all these things that have happened, but also celebrating with you, uh, it, it was really great to be able to track all of you and, uh, and, and live fi vicariously through you. So it was a lot of fun still just uh, just keeping up with you. So we've got Colby Gambo, Chris Perkins, and Candace McCoochin, and we we might have some, uh, uh, did I not do that right? <laughs> You're totally Touch good, me. keep going. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's my thing. <laughs> I, I do terrible with names, so, um, and we may have a couple others uh, uh, joining us late. So this is great. Uh, we wanna get some recap from you and, and, uh, and, and hear more about this. Uh, Ted, you've got our first question. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's always fun to go to the world championship and, and, you know, John and I, we've been to, to, to many of them. Um, but oftentimes it's the things that are outside of the race that end up being like the more memorable, uh, mem memorable things. So I'm gonna, we'll just start off with, with you, Chris, and we'll go down the line. Uh, so Chris, can you tell us something about the experience of, you know, traveling to Finland and racing in Finland? Um, so, sorry, other than the race that um, is, was, was a highlight for you um yeah i mean i i just would probably have to say the people um everybody i met in finland uh the finnish people in particular were just really nice um it was helpful that they all spoke english that made yep. things really easy uh, but everybody was just delightful to talk to um so that was a big highlight for me awesome well you know they say it's one of the happiest countries in the in the world and i, I can see that why I assume that uh, the people is, you know, is, is probably 90% of that. So awesome. All right, Colby, how about you? Uh, probably for me, the highlight would be like first, that's my first time going anywhere across to that side of the world. And then just being able to do it like with my dad, it's kind of a cool experience getting to walk around, see all the, the cool places. And then just the atmosphere of world championships is so much different and more like, intense but more fun so i think that was kind of cool yeah i you know and i'm gonna just add in like what a cool experience right like very few times in your life in anybody's life do they get to like do something like that with their parent right so for those people that don't know um colby's dad also qualified and raced and i mean i can't imagine that happens very often in in, in situations not just in triathlon but in any sport where father and son both get to qualify for a world championship in Finland and like travel across the world together. And I mean, I just think that's such a special, special thing. And for those of you that don't know, they got this unbelievable picture um, during the race of, of the two of them together, which was a one in a million shot as well. So yeah, I think that that's super, super special. So great. All right, Candace, how about you? Um, we actually drove around Finland. And so we ended up in uh, Lapland and we visited a, um, like we did the Husky sled where the dogs pull the sleds. Oh my gosh. Um, and that was just the coolest thing I've ever, one of the coolest things I've ever done. So the kids loved it. It was, it was amazing. So like a full dog sled team and you're. Yeah, there, we went to this Husky, uh, I don't want to call it a farm, but the, the owner of our hotel has this, he does this on the side. And so he has 110 dogs and, um, they, we had each had our little own like cart and then they strapped up eight dogs to each cart. 
And then like we went into the woods and these dogs like took us around and um, man, they're fast and they love it. Like they were so just being on the hooked up to the cart. Yep. These dogs were like, they couldn't wait to go. And they were, it was just the coolest thing. I, I'd never experienced something like that before. And I, it was just really neat. Oh, awesome. So I'm going to follow up with all three of you. Did anybody see a reindeer? Yes. Okay. Candace saw a reindeer too. We actually went and walked reindeer. Um, we did a hike with everyone got their own reindeer. And then um, after that, like when we were further up north, after we did the whiskey, whiskey, we did not do whiskey, the husky <laughs> thing. Um, they, we saw great, like wild reindeer. So it was funny seeing like going and actually spending time. We went to Santa's village. So for those who don't know, like the, it, the Arctic circles up there. And so the North pole where Santa actually lives is, is there. So we went there for the kids and then you can actually meet Santa's reindeers and then you can hike with the reindeers. So we actually went hiking with the reindeers. Oh my gosh. That's so cool. I know that when we were planning our trip, um, that's something my wife really wanted to do was actually, you know, go see the reindeer and go to like a reindeer farm and go to that place. And so, no, that sounds awesome. Thank you for sharing. All right, John, you're up. All right. Well, um, I usually like to start with sequentially what's happening in the before the race and so forth and, you know, swim, bike, run. But I want to start with the finish line. What was the finish line like at this world championship? And uh, who wants I'll, who wants to start? All right, so we'll go the same order. Then we'll go. Uh, Chris, go ahead. Oh, it was great. Um, a lot of energy. Uh, it, it's probably the most energetic finish line I've seen. Um, and it it does a lot for you as you're as you're coming to the finish to just boost your energy. Mm -hmm. Like I was loving it. Uh, I always do that. I always have this problem where I look down though when I'm coming across the finish line, so all my pictures look pretty terrible because I have a hat on blocking my face. Um, but I was I was thrilled, happy, and the the uh, the volunteers there were great too. But I mean, it was super helpful to have them uh there with the space blankets to throw on us as we we're coming through mm -hmm. just completely drenched oh. and cold and and yeah oh, it was great yeah it was a wet day for for the men and uh cold still for the women with the the fog in the morning uh but yeah really really uh that's great colby how about you um uh, as it was only my third race um can't speak <laughs> on too much experience uh but personally i know a lot of people hated it but there is this super steep like bridge that you had to climb over three times <laughs> everyone hated it but i thought that was like the coolest thing ever because no. right coming to the finish you go up on this thing you look over and you could see everyone all around you like from all the countries cheering you on it doesn't matter like where you were from every single person was like cheering for you as you cross the line um obviously i had couple bad photos with the pain face but it was still just kind of like a different atmosphere going across because you see everyone from everywhere and no one is taking it away from you like everyone cares for everyone so that was quite cool to see that's wonderful that's great i love it yeah real community there candace what was your finish yeah like? We had, I had a little bit of a different experience because, uh, in the, right before the swim started, the announcer actually brought up the finish line. Um, and he talked specifically kind of about what Chris was saying. And he, he talked about the significance of the finish line and making sure that you're not running with your head down, put your head up, yeah. do something epic, really meant like he, he really did a great job of telling you what to expect and how to handle the finish line and make that your moment. And I've never done that. Right. And for me, um, I had a really hard run, a really brutal run. And so when I saw the finish line, it, it kind of like breathed a little bit of life into me. Um, there was a ton of signs. Like, I feel like they decorated the finish line a lot more than they did normally. Like the carpet was it was, it's always there, but it was like pristine. Um, they had signs and flags and it was just, it was 
the most decked out finish line I've ever seen. And, um, it just, I don't know if it was cause I had such a hard time. I was so happy to see it or if it was just the overall energy around it. But the, that last shoot was the nicest finish line I'd ever seen. And then they had like, instead of bike catchers, they had like people catchers, like what Chris was saying. So as soon as you crossed the finish line, you had your own person who wrapped you up then you had an, and they, they carried you like I say carried, but not physically carried, but they, they took most of your body weight and walked you through this routine. So they walked you and you got meddled and then they walked you and you got chipped and then you like, they walked you through this whole thing. So it was, that's not happened to me before either. And that was, that was a really, really cool. The finish line was a really cool experience. Oh, I love it. What a, what a great way to start this discussion and just to hear the excitement in each of your voices about that finish line. It, it is really meaningful. So that, that, that's fantastic. Okay, so my I'm going to go a little bit different tack on this. So every time I race, there's always like a story of something that like kind of iconic that happens during a race. So I've already talked to Colby. Uh, we talked a couple days ago. Um, but uh, and so I know Colby's, but I'm only and so we're going to start with Colby. Um, Colby, tell us your little war story about it, it, what happened to you in the swim, because I think that it's a very unique thing that happened to you. Um, and then we'll go through uh, Chris and Candace after that. So go ahead, Colby. Uh, so the swim, we were lining up. I was kind of freaking out a bit, uh, nervous. Candace was there, which was a big help. She was trying to calm me down and stuff, but you still get the the jitters. And so I was talking with all the people in my age group and I'm like, oh, what do you swim at? Just so I could kind of gauge where I should put myself so I can draft off of them the whole time. <laughs> and everyone's like, oh, about 34 minutes. I'm like, perfect. I'll just sit right there, jumped in the water. And then I looked up and they were just gone. Every single <laughs> one of them, except maybe like three or four of us. And then I found this one kid he kicked a lot, so it was like perfect for the draft. I finally felt what it was like to draft in the water, and I sat on him for the first 1,300 yards, and then it was going smooth. I was doing like perfect timing, on pace, wasn't using a lot of energy, and then all of a sudden, the group behind us, the 40 to 45 or whatever age group that was, the first couple of them went flying by, and it just kind of threw me off just enough that I lost the feet I was on. And so I looked up to see where my person was that I was drafting off. And all of a sudden he kicked me in the face, got me like clean, real good kick. And it kind of sent me into like a, a daze. And so I popped up for a second. And as I did that, my hamstrings also kind of cramped a bit. So I started to freak out. So I put my arm up just because I didn't want to be in the traffic of everything. Uh, so this port guy came over and my lip had the smallest cut ever, but it was bleeding like crazy. So they thought it was a lot worse than it was. And they were trying to actually pull me from the swim. Like the guys on the boat were like, oh, we got to pull you. You're not the first person. Your race is going to be done. And I was like, I can't. So I started freaking out. So I let go of the boat. And I just kind of floated for a minute, got myself kind of together and then finished the swim and I was not happy coming out of the water but I got it done I just think it's remarkable that they're like hey we're pulling you from the race yeah yeah they're saying something like, about like it's being it's uh, bleeding too much and it's too cold to be like dealing with something like having I uh, couldn't really understand their English either so that was part of it yeah well I was thinking maybe they thought you had a concussion Right. Because that would be a, a legitimate reason for pulling you from the race. You got kicked in the face or kicked in the head and they wanted to assess you for a concussion. I could see that. But just a little bit of blood, like shoot, it's triathlon. There's always a little bit of blood. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. That's such a good story. But like, you know, and then the, to have the wherewithal to recognize that, hey, you know, I'm not going to get pulled from this race. Like, I'm I'm good um, unless you did have a concussion. So that's the, that, that, that's, that's a good story. All right. So, Chris, what do we got? Um, hold on. And we're getting we're, Dr. Chad Hansen jo joining us too. Oh, we okay. Sorry, uh, hit the wrong button there. I'm back. <laughs> uh, I had to cough. Um, I didn't have any uh any issues during the race. Okay. Um, it went really smooth for me. My my uh story came before the race. 
Okay. So I show up uh, to my bike rack uh, the morning of the race and I'm looking over my tire pressure and I notice my front tire is low. So I turn it over and there's a pool of sealant under it and a nice hole in my tire. So that was a pretty stressful situation for me. Um, luckily, the bike mechanics, they were great, but couldn't get it to seal. So um, they had to throw a tube in it. So that was a, a messy situation to deal with. Um, but that whole time, you know, until that, that tire was good to go, I was worried. I was like, oh, crap, am I going to get this fixed in time? Uh, you know, of course, this would happen. Uh, I only brought one spare tube with me for the race. I hope I don't have to use that right now. Um, luckily, you know, the the prep I did ahead of time, making sure I had, um, you know, my, my valve extenders, yep. um, just knowing where everything was that I needed made it really quick and easy to get that situation dealt with. And then... Um, get on the get on the way and didn't have another issue for the rest of the race so. so you actually had a cut in your tire not a cut uh small puncture um but it wouldn't seal interesting okay and yeah, no I, idea where, where how it happened no idea i wasn't having any issues uh leading up to it maybe i rolled over something on the way to uh t1 yep. to rack my bike but yeah all right uh candace I have okay. I mean, aside from the normal silly stuff, I slipped coming out of T1 and landed on my back, but that was more embarrassing than you anything. Fell? Like, yeah, I fell. But, and I was on a carpet, but I'm like naturally clumsy. I think the worst <laughs> part about it was like, it was right in front of all the spectators. So everybody at the same time was like, <gasps> I was like your, oh my God, this you is the bike? worst. No, I was on just my feet and didn't even have a reason to fall. Like, I was running around. I got out of the, it was like I was running out of the water, had my wetsuit in my hand. I turned the corner and my feet just flew from underneath me. And I just like, Chad was like, did you banana peel slip? I'm like, that's a perfect explanation. I banana peeled slip. Like I swear my feet touched my forehead and I just landed. So that happened and then um nothing hurt it was just really embarrassing and then the only other issue I really had was um I have had to run a lot in my bike shoes and I've never had to do that before oh yeah and that created a lot of problems for me it ended up being close to a half a mile I had to run between the two transitions in my bike shoes and so it, it pulled my calves I, my calves weren't used to running like that. And so I think because the water was cold and my feet were numb and the position of how my feet were angled, it, it cramped my calves so bad. And I thought it would go away in the bike and it did. But then when I got out of T2, I had to run another quarter mile in my bike shoes and they cramped as soon as I started running mm. in the bike shoes. And then even though Colby loved that ramp, as soon as I had to run up that steep ramp, it was like putting the pressure back on my toes again, like the bike shoes. And it was, they were, they were just seizing. I say cramping, but they were like pulling. Oh. So that was the only like weird thing that I had, but everything else was great. All right. Awesome. Hey, uh, so Chad Hansen just jumped on. So Chad, we're um, going through kind of war stories of, uh, of the race. So uh, do you have a, a story that something kind of interesting that happened to you during the race? Um, no, I mean, we, I was in the very last age group on the men's day. And maybe so you could, maybe you could talk about your, your, the situation at the, at the, at the start, we, you know, we talked earlier about, you know, getting to the shoot. Like, you know, I think that's super interesting. Yeah. So um because we were the very last group, we started almost two and a half hours after the probe men. And so certainly an unusual setup uh, compared to any other race where, you know, within 20 minutes, everyone's in the water. Um, you know, we were getting in the water as Fred Funk was going up the hill and we could hear the announcers saying that he was coming into T2 and we were still you know, waiting to start. Um, and I think because it was just so long, um, 
all the other 45 to 49 males were tired of waiting. And so they were all in the shoot. And I walked over with like, I don't know, 25 minutes left thinking I'd be somewhere in the middle. And I was basically the last person in the shoot. And so I'm getting ready, getting my goggles ready. I look behind me. There's nobody behind me. They're like no one else fills in. You know, every time you're in a race, like as you get to the shoot, like people kind of just start filling in behind you and you're just in the mix. Well, no one filled in after me. So, you know, there was maybe 10 people that started after I started. I was like literally the last person in the water. Um, and that was, again, just timing wise of, you know, when you wake up and when you do your routines and nutrition and all that, that, that threw me off a little bit, but I mean, it was cool being able to watch the men, you know, get out of the water and, and, and do their T1 and get on the bike. And, um, but yeah, it was just a long, a long wait period for our, uh, for our group to get started. How long was it between when the transition closed and when you started? Two and a half hours. That's a long, that's a long time. And if it, you know, obviously in, in a hotter venue, you know, you, you're taking your nutrition. It's it's baked in the it's baking in the sun for three hours. It, it, you know, here it wasn't a big deal because it was cold and rainy. But you know, and also with you know latex tubes, you know, they don't hold air great. And you're thinking, you know, yeah, they should hold it for two and a half hours. But you know, how are they going? How much are they going to hold for five hours? Yeah. Well, and then also I was thinking about it, like even nutrition between t between when you set up and you go right you have two and a half hours you gotta you gotta be eating you gotta be fueling and normally you don't have to you set up your transition you have a gel and you get in the water right? exactly that, that's yeah, kind of weird that's a new thing for sure awesome okay great all right john you're up all right i love these stories this is this is fantastic let me give you i, I want to tap into something a little different you trained so hard for this event and uh, each of you probably said, I'm going to work on this specifically for the event, whatever this is. So I'm curious as to what did you work on in your training that really paid off on race day? What was it that you could say, I worked hard for this. This is what I wanted to do. And you did it. Chris, you want to kick us off? Sure. Um, yeah, it. it it's hard to nail down just one thing. I know what I didn't train, uh, which was the swimming. Um, <laughs> but for me, the big thing is I wanted to make some really solid improvements. Um, and I knew it wasn't going to come from the swim. Uh, so I, I just focused a lot on the bike and the run. I really upped my, um, my, my weekly training load. And along with that, I did a ton of zone two training, mm -hmm. just hours on the trainer and hours on the treadmill, um, you know, low intensity, uh, putting in the miles. And um, then on the weekends is really where I would do my harder efforts. Like if I went for a group ride or if I did um, the course on full gas, I would do more of a tempo with some uh, threshold efforts thrown in here and there. And I have to say that for me, that really paid off. Um, I, I never found during my training that I was uh, too exhausted to, you know, do what my plan was for the week or to keep going the following week and so on and so forth. And when I, when I saw my, my bike split in particular, I was, completely blown away just with how much improvement I had made since St. George on a course that had a relatively similar um, elevation profile to it. So. Yeah, that, you yeah. had a great bike split for sure. That's awesome. Well, that's great that that training pays off and now you can, you can, you can log that into your, you know, how to prepare for, for the next one. So that's great. Yeah. Candice, how about you? Finding that mute. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Um, I wanted to improve my bike on this one. Um, I also wanted to um 
a lot of the swims have been in a river. And so my last lake swim, I had PR'd at a 37 and I wanted to make sure that I could replicate that again. Um, so I haven't swam a lake in a while. So I really wanted to shoot for a 36, 37. I know a lot of people don't really focus on the swim. And I know, you know, sometimes my coaches get a little cranky because I spend time on the swim, but I feel like it's, completely change the way that I step up to a race because it's the first thing that I have to do and so it's like all the pressure of being nervous about the swim is gone because I know I can handle it and I can handle it well so the confidence of going into the race is very very different for me the last couple of races it's like all the anxiety that would come from us, the very first discipline, it just allows me to be more comfortable. And it's, I think that's impacting my bike. So I tried to work on my bike a lot. I tried to maintain my swim a lot. Um, I also was really sick several months out of this last training. So I, I wasn't able to focus as much as I wanted to, but, um, I was pretty happy with my bike overall. Like I didn't kill, I, I was pretty happy with my bike. Oh, I love it. No, it's great when something that you focus on your swim really pays off and it has other benefits as well. And that's, that's fantastic. Chad, how about you? What was something that you trained specifically for this event and, uh, and paid off? Well, I'm going to say dragging my, my CDA ever so slightly down. So um, actually all, all the, all the races I've done lately have had a very similar elevation profile and I'm, you know, I'm a kind of a bigger guy. I hit the power numbers that my coach sets for me, but the times just don't reflect the power. And this race, I, I got, you know, in terrible conditions, I got extremely close to what my expected time should be for the power that was prescribed. And so I was super happy with being able to hold the power, hold a better position, um, really, really stay, stay in the zone and not, not overbike the course, but uh, it, it, you know, it went really, really well. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's great. Again, when you, something like that pays off that, you know, changing CDA, changing position or, maybe shaving the Stanley cup beard off or whatever it was. So <laughs> that's awesome. That, that might've been the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Colby, how about you? Uh, so for me, I would say, so I did Oregon like a month before. So leading up to that one, I really focused on like the bike. Mm -hmm. um, that was kind of like my biggest thing I focused on. And then coming into the world championships, I was focusing more on not overbiking. So just as a reference for Oregon, I was supposed to do about 220 watts for the whole thing. And I set a new FTP and did 280 the entire time. So I way overbiked. So then after a couple of changes in training, uh, we went over the numbers and figured out what would work best to help me with the run. Cause I'd always blow up on the run. And then just by like going over the numbers and changing things just a little bit and seeing what numbers make sense, um, dropping the power just a bit to save my legs for the run. I feel like that was my biggest improvement because on the run course, I, there was no point that I felt tired. Um, it was more so dealing with shin splints, but before that kicked in, I was on like a pretty good pace for myself at least on the run and I didn't feel exhausted like I normally do um yeah I think that would probably be my biggest improvement I love it that's great yeah the bike strategy and how to pace it that that's fantastic and again you're still sort of new to the to the distance in sport so really uh really great to see the learning that that you're doing here that's fantastic yeah, it's because he had he had good luck because he stopped and collected all my water bottles. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And and I'd like to add for, for Colby, he's saying this is his third race. This is his third triathlon, right? Or no, fourth triathlon. Third third seventy point three. Yeah, third seventy point three. I did one local and then the pumpkin man without the swim. <laughs> yep. So really, your third triathlon where you actually had a swim bike run. So, I mean, pretty, it's pretty impressive to think about, you know, it's, you know, your third race, 
uh, competing in a world championship and, and, and having the wherewithal to even think about like, Hey, you know, what? I, I got to control the power on the bike. I have to, you know, so I can run like thinking about those things uh, in your third triathlon is it's pretty remarkable. So uh, congratulations to, well, congratulations to all of you. So that being said, um, how are the medals? Was it, was it, were they really pretty cool or? They're, they're pretty cool. They're nice. They're, they're super heavy. heavy though. They're heavy? Yeah. Yeah. They All have right. a nice piece of stained glass in them too. They're, they're really nice. Awesome. Awesome. I, you know, it's funny because like, you know, down the road, those are the things that I tend to keep. I mean, I got my metal rack uh, up behind me and uh, I always like a good, a good world championship medal. They tend to be really, yeah, really nice. So that's awesome. Um, and then how about the rest of the, like the, the swag and the, and, and, and the, and the gear, I know Colby's got his hat on. What, what did you guys think about that this time? Anyone? It was good. Um, I like the bag. The bag was the best bag I've gotten so far. It was a really nice uh, kind of a transition bag. Awesome. Uh, so you can carry all your gear with you. I like that a lot. All right. Awesome. Anybody else get anything fun? Oh, there's the metal. Oh, there you go. Oh, nice. All right. Then you saw the towel. Yeah. yeah. And then, so there was a, it was a finisher towel. Yeah. yeah I that's mean, it's, what they kind, it's kind of, of wrapped a towel, to it. But oh that's more of a banner cool. yeah yeah it's gonna get hung up oh great that's so great so um let's speak let's talk specifically about the the actually let's talk about the the, the bike and i want to talk to the men in particular this time sorry candace because the the conditions were horrible right um not for not for candace because it didn't rain when you were riding but for the for the men um there was a lot of standing water um, there was a lot of talking to people, carnage, uh, a lot of crashes, um, water bottles all over the road in some places. Uh, so let's just maybe, I don't know, let's start with Chad this time. Chad, can you describe uh, how you had to adjust your, you know, what you were going to do on the bike based off of, uh, off of the conditions? Yeah, so... Um... You know, being the last group, it, the water and the rain was all well underway before I even got on the bike. Mm -hmm. um, and so by the time there's kind of a mile and a half in town, then you go through a little, you know, temporary bike passageway, and then it gets you onto the country road. And the minute you get on the country road, the first 17 miles is kind of the turn and burn. You really go hard stay nice and low and then when you hit that corner at the 17th mile mark then you start coming back with the wind well the the rain is coming at you so hard and there's standing water everywhere so you can't really just put your head you know this is the part of the road where normally you could just put your head down and just crush it and you really couldn't do that because you know the lines were slippery there's water everywhere there's people riding erratically because of the conditions. Um, and, and so it was really hard to, to kind of stay focused and stay, um, stay arrow uh, and, and even, you know, try to find wheels to, to tag onto because, you know, they're spitting water up into you. And so it's not exactly enjoyable, even, even if you're, you know, the right distance away um they're they're just for for my age group there wasn't a lot of teamwork out there to try to try to push through everyone's just kind of slogging along on their own yeah interesting colby uh for me it was since i was the second last group by the time i got out of the water i was a little cool because it was starting to rain quite hard so i was excited to put the arm warmers on the gloves on but went to put on the arm warmers and they were soaked. So I was like, oh, there goes that. So the first, I would say 30, 40 miles, I was uncontrollably cold. Like I was shaking the entire time. So it's kind of hard to sit in your arrow as you're shaking. So your front wheel's kind of going a little all over. Um, I got out with a decent group uh, of the 40 to 44 age group. There's a I'd say about 10 of us that were pretty solid. We were all trying to kind of work together because we all knew that 
the only way we're getting through it is if we work together. Um, but even then, like Chad said, the roads were just so bad. You couldn't, even if you're the right distance away, you're getting just completely hammered with water from the wheels. So kind of got to a point where it's, you either sit on someone's wheel and in a way you kind of just close your eyes and go based off of how much water's hitting you, if you're on the right line or not, <laughs> or you drop back so you can see. So it's kind of a gamble you have to play, but it worked out. Awesome. Chris? Uh, yeah, I think it was, uh, I, I probably had a little different of a mindset. Um, uh, I started the bike course dry, and then it was about three to five miles later that it started raining on us. But um, as soon as it started raining, I just got a big smile on my face. I was I was so happy because um, that's what I I had gone into the race expecting it to rain. Um, and, you know, when conditions went to what I expected, I was happy. I know my bike handling skills. I know what I can do. Um, and I knew it was going to cause other people uh, issues. Um, so uh, I just kind of, you know, did my thing powered through and just knew I was going to have to probably just keep my head more on a swivel than normal. But outside of that, um, I knew I wasn't going to get hot. Uh, I knew I was just going to be a little bit cold and a little bit wet. And I'll take that over hot, sweaty and miserable any day. So for me, the, I couldn't have asked for better conditions for that ride. How big a group were you in, Chris? I, I wasn't in a group. <laughs> uh, I couldn't find anybody to stay with. I was just passing everybody I could. Um, there were a couple times where it seemed like there were going to be some folks who tried to stick with me, which I thought was good. But usually by the time I would look back to see where they were, they weren't there anymore. Um, I know it sounds like I'm bragging, but it's it's just I mean, it's it just kind of how I ride because um, it's it's the it's my favorite part of the course so it's the bikes so i you know i i want to just add a piece here and john and i have talked this on the podcast before so in nevada when it rains we don't ride right because tomorrow is going to be a better day and it's something we've talked about often is is i try to go ride when it rains just to gain these experiences because I'm, i gotta be honest with you out of some of the bigger races of my life when i get there it's raining and if you've never raced in, or ridden in the rain, um, it's a, it is definitely, it, it can be a problem for you. And I like the fact that you said, you know, you keep your head on a swivel and you know what you can do, but you got to also understand that the physics do change, right? The, the amount of friction on the road and the amount of basically friction between your, your tires and, and, and the surface, those are different. The braking is different. Um, and you have to practice that, you know, and we're in a world now where so many people, all they do is spend time on their trainer. And you mentioned it too. You spend a lot of time on your trainer, but if you never put yourself in those situations until you race, it can be very uh, nerve wracking. And you know, you obviously, Chris, were very confident and, and, and that's great. But I think that that's an important piece that, uh, that people need to, to recognize, especially in Las Vegas. Right. Like if you live somewhere where it rains all the time, yeah, you gotta you get a ride in the rain. But here we just have the opportunity not to. So good stuff. Uh John, you're up. All right. Well, you know, one thing I really enjoy about these types of big races that include not only the the competition and, and the number of people, but the travel and, and what have you. I enjoy the planning. I, I think some of you do as well. And I know Candace and I change a lot of messages about you know course recon or or you know how how to approach it and sometimes for me it can lead to some race anxiety that i'm worried about something that maybe will never happen and uh so i'm curious was there anything that you were uh really planning for or trying to be ready for that never happened Oh, I love it. This is good. Nobody. <laughs> Nothing. That surprises me. <laughs> well, uh, so I mean, I was, outside. 
Oh, now they all outside, outside the race. Um, Lati doesn't have a lot of accommodations. Mm. And so a lot of people, I know Chris stayed in Helsinki. There was people staying in villages close to there, but trying to stay in town um, was a bit of a challenge. We actually didn't have a spot and then randomly checked Airbnb one day and there was a new listing and we're pretty sure we were the very first people to ever stay at this girl's apartment. In in fact, she still, she left her clothes there. She, she kind of let us in. She's like, oh, I haven't had time to take all my stuff out. So it was basically just, you know, she was cashing in on the, on the race. Oh. Um, but if you could find a place close to the venue, everything was walkable. And so it was nice to be able to walk to the restaurants, walk to the venue, uh, you know, walk down to the, to T1 and T2. And we didn't, once we got to town, we didn't move our car for three days. Oh, wow. Oh, that's great. And that is a big, and I know I get, I get sometimes really zeroed in on some of the logistics and it's always a relief when the logistics, they, they end up working out. That's, that's awesome. Candice, I, I think you were, you had something. Oh, I was going to say originally it was supposed to rain on my race day. Mm -hmm. So I was, a, uh, I didn't necessarily practice the bike in the rain too much. I did make sure the last week, like you guys were kind of talking about, but I did ask a thousand questions. Um, yeah. I ride with, uh, Derek over at MVBT. Ooh. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. The dog just took the phone and, uh, I probably asked him for two weeks. What do, how do, what do I do if it's raining? What, how do I, can I turn this corner this fast? Can I do this? Can I do that? What break, am I supposed to hit the front break or the, the back break? Um, so that was a little, I had anxiety the week before I left, but then it kind of cleared up. <laughs> Luckily, I mean, I have to give the men a ton of credit because that was just insane. And trying to spec, even just trying to spectate them that day, it was like, I had to tap. The kids were soaked. Everybody was like miserable. I don't know how they did it. Like I was just in awe. Every single one of them. I, I couldn't believe what they were, they were dealing with. So like, I know I've posted about it, but hats off to every single one of them. Cause that was insane. I'm so grateful. I didn't have to deal with that. <laughs> well, it's great. I mean, to plan for the rain, cause you're right. I think at first it looked like the rain was going to happen for the women and yeah. so the plan for all that, having the right gear, you know, that like you talk about the, you know, how to, how to ride in the rain. That's great. And that's wonderful that it, it, you never had to use any of that gear. That's great. I think my husband wanted to kill me because I had about four suitcases because I, <laughs> I also didn't know what to do. Like right, right. it was their summer, but it was also winter. And it was like, I, I had to bring clothes for every every situation so that was also one of those things where it was like you have to plan for it but you have no idea what you're you're getting into when you're there oh, oh i love it colby anything that that you uh that that weren't great that you were maybe worried about going into it um i would say if anything it was more so before the practice swim so i was part of the uh travel group so there's like a hundred of us all part of the traveling group and the first day we went to do a practice swim, we just ran out of time. So we kept asking everyone, oh, how is the water? How's the water? And every single person we asked said it was super cold. Oh, oh. So I kind of had that panic moment of, oh, I'm going to freeze in the water again. It's going to be Oceanside all over the 12 minute transition. Um, but then as soon as we jumped in the water for the practice swim, it felt great. It was like perfect temperature, not hot, not cold, just something you can kind of get your stride, not have to worry about overheating or being cold. Mm -hmm. uh, I love it. That is always a relief when, when you hit that water and it is, it is, it is doable. Mm -hmm. uh, I love it. Ted. Yeah. So I'm going to ask uh, a question thinking to, to the future. So you all just finished this race and, you know, we always, John and I always talk about never making any big life decisions uh, a week after a race, but did racing there make you more or less likely to want to go to the next 70.3 worlds in New Zealand and, and, and why? So Chris. Yeah, I would, I'd definitely love to go. Um, uh, I, it was a great race. Uh, 
there's just you know the logistical challenges that exist with that um if i was to go again i would go i would do it a little differently i'd bring my family this time yep um and i'd recommend that for anybody going uh, i basically spent most of my time there by myself uh which leading up to the race was nice um because you know i was on my own time um i didn't have to stress over anything i just did what i wanted when i wanted but after the race was a little bit boring um and like not like right after the race because there were people around but like the days after mm -hmm. um was a little bit boring um but as far as um you know what they put on for us uh the course itself the people there racing yeah i definitely love to go um it won't be new zealand for me but maybe sometime in the future <laughs> yeah so john uh just breaking in here they did have they announced where the next world championship is after new zealand i think you were mentioning it uh i not. can't remember if it's if they have announced that there's been some different messages out okay. like I see they're going to be Spain like or Talon even I've heard uh, they said they had two bids out okay. one was St. George again and then one was in Spain okay but they hadn't announced who had won the bid okay yeah so maybe St. George again yeah that'd be for me that'd be awesome you know like i think that just driving two hours is way better than going to spain that's just me a little yeah. more difficult to qualify for around here though yeah yeah true i'll just go to spain to qualify for saint george easy uh colby same Mine question is i would say yes and no <laughs> yes for the reason i like the competition and since I'm so bad at the swim compared to everyone else in my age group, it gives me something to really focus on, like what I need to really work on. Because the bike, it's close. Obviously, my age group is kind of a hard group because uh, there's they have quite a few years on me, which is a lot of development that you go through. But I'm not too, too far off on the bike. And then the run, I feel like it's something doable. But the swim is something I really need to focus on, which I think would be a benefit uh leading up to another one but at the same time it's with the cost of everything for me personally it's almost more worth it to do more in the states because i could get three four races in the states versus one way out there so i feel like just based off experience wise um for the race itself i would say no but at the same time i also want to travel because it's cool to go <laughs> everywhere <laughs> Awesome. Okay. How about you, Candace? Um, I don't know what I want to do. Um, I, I liked worlds a lot. It was a completely different feel. It was a completely different group of people. So that was really cool. I think for me, the pressure of staying on the level that I need to stay on to want to compete at that level, there's definitely more I can do to to be better. So that's exciting, but it's like, how much time do I want to use right now? I've got a lot going on. I've got a teenager, I've got a business, like how much work and hours do I want to put into that? And then I think for me, like I love to travel, but I think going out of the country, I really like the fulls for that. I think doing it in terms of the half, it just didn't it was a great trip and I had a great race and I enjoyed it. But I think if I do that again, I'll probably want to do a, a full and spend that money and that investment. And then I just never thought the traveling on the plane for that long would impact me as much as it did. So it really is like a two week ordeal. I mean, it, it, it was just a whole nother beast traveling like that. And then, um, wanting to compete at the level I wanted to compete at. So I, mm. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. That's no that that's completely fair. I'm going to I'm going to follow it up with this little devil's advocate for you, okay? Cuz I love I love where you went with that. Let's say you were one of the best 400 meter runners in your age group in the world. Would you travel to a world championship? Well, for, yeah, cuz that's the last one minute. I'm sure if What does race distance have to do with it? I just feel like 
it's a lot of like time and money that I'm spending out there. So I think the saddest, like, I don't know how to, other than like when I did a full in Montre Blanc, it just felt like it was worth the cost of what I was doing. Okay. Like I I was there for a much, I'm not trying to take away from worlds. I don't, I don't know why the distance matters to me. It just felt like a, like a more of a celebration. I don't know. I'm going to shoot myself in the foot with this. So I have no idea. It, you know, because it, it, it's it, I, I wasn't trying to be to to be difficult or anything. I just no it's an interesting thing because I've heard other people say the exact same thing. It's like well, yeah. they would, they wouldn't travel to, for example, like the ITU Worlds for sprint distance. And I was like, well, you qualified, like you won the national championship in the United States, and you won't go to Spain to. Well, it's just too short of a race. I'm like, well, what's the what does the distance have yeah. to do with experience? That's a good question. I don't know. I think maybe for the dollar amount, I feel like the sacrifice is worth the bigger dollar amount for the bigger time spent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I I, I get it. And and we're thinking similarly, I don't really enjoy fools. So I'm like trying to wrap my head around (laughs) around it. I think I think I get I, I think I get what Candace is saying there as well. I mean, none of us are winning any of that prize purse. Yeah, you know, we don't we don't have any of that to offset it. We don't have sponsors and stuff who are offsetting our costs and anything like that. So, um, you got you there. There is a bang for your buck, you know, yeah. calculation that goes into any of this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I I was there for ten days and I felt it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, uh, this is this is not something that that we can do very often especially when there's local um, lo- local uh, races that we can go to yeah. um, less than the day's drive away uh, just for the cost of entry and a couple nights in a hotel. Got it. All right, Chad, how about you? New Zealand? Um, I would love to go. I, you know, <clears throat> I think like the others said, you know, the logistics are, are a challenge. Um, I, th- I thought uh, the venue this time was actually really great. I, I know there's people had a lot of problems getting their bikes home, um, but the, the venue itself was phenomenal. Um, Estonia was great. I think a lot of people went over there and just thought that was the best part of the trip. We certainly did. Um, so yeah, I, w- I would love to go certainly feel like I have room for improvements and it it is a different mindset. Whereas I think the goals you have for this type of race are a lot different than you would have for a regular race. Mm -hmm. There's just so many fast people in the world and a lot of, a lot of them are former pros and a lot of them are, you know, for whatever reason, I don't think there's a lot of Americans that keep racing competitively, but I think a lot of other nationalities, um, former pros, uh, will just keep racing because that's what they can do. And there's just a ton of fast people out there. So it's a, it's a neat experience being around so much talent and, and realizing, um, how many great athletes there are in the world. So Chad, uh, what was the time that would have won your age group at this race? Uh, I didn't even look. I, I mean, I think I, I, I think look. it was. I think it was. I think it was like three fifty six. It was three fifty six. That's awesome. So if you think about like exactly what he just said, like you have to go into these with a different mentality. Like, I, I no no offense to any of us here, but none of us can go three fifty six. Right. I mean, th- th- there were pros that didn't go 356. Exactly. exactly. So to go there and say, hey, I'm going to go win my age group at this race is is insane. Insane. Right. Because <laughs> they're 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 former pros. I know one time I went over to Europe and I raced um, in Finland or in, in Denmark and uh, I was really shooting for a podium spot. And I think I finished seventh. The guy that won had won six Olympic medals, including four golds in rowing mm-hmm. right well now you you know the, the pedigree is there right like the guy was like one of the best endurance athletes in the world well there's no way i'm gonna i'm gonna beat this guy you know and 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 that but that's so that does change the dynamic right and to me like racing these world championship races a lot of times it's been 
just all about me, like not even worrying about the, like what position you get, just like, can I execute on the day? Like we've been talking about, like, I've been working on this. Did I, was I able to do it? Whereas sometimes the races in, that I've raced in North America, personally, I'm like, you know, it's podium or bust, right? Like that's the, that's the, that's been the level for me. And so I think it's, it can be sometimes freeing to be at a race like that where, and there's nothing to qualify, right? Like you're already, you've already, you've already qualified. So you can kind of take that off of your, off of your shoulders as well. The girl that, who won my age group, she beat half the pro women out. Yeah. Like the girl who who the girl who hit first in 40. Yeah. And it was like it it was very different feeling because I think I passed maybe five people on the bike. And then like I said, I, I rode by myself the whole time. Like I didn't see and I was getting past. It wasn't a ton, but I was getting past and it was it was a very different feeling than at home it was actually every time I got past it was like I would almost get a smile because it was humbling it was like these people are so good and I get to share I get to share the space with them like it wasn't it was it was really weird we're at home like if I'm at home and all these people go past me I'm like oh and I get frustrated and here it was like it was almost like an like an honor, you know what I mean? And I don't know how to explain it. It it felt so different. I wasn't frustrated by people who were better than me. It was it was just a very different like in awe. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I love this. And and I love the question about would you go to another race down the road? Because it it I know what can I actually share some of your feelings as well? I like this. If I'm going for a big trip, I want to do a big race. But the other thing that I've learned is with the, the 70.3, it's taken me to places that I never would go to unless I went to a race. And so it's really a neat experience to, you know, go to, uh, you know, Lati. I mean, who would have gone to Lati unless you were going there for uh, an event like this? So I think that's neat. And we're almost out of time, but I'm curious, um, as you did this event, which is more than just a, a regular race, what was something that was really neat that was a non-race event, you know, that, that was still part of the event, like the, the welcoming banquet, the parade of nations, the, whatever it was? So well, I've, I've got one. Yeah. Um, after the race, we had a reservation. Um, actually this was the day before so it was after the women's race we we had the reservation at italian restaurants and i had to check my bike in so i got there a little bit late um anyway we sit down we're in the back corner and right next to us walks taylor nib and her manager and they had they were they were in the back back corner trying to be away from all the people and so um it was in, you know, just kind of overhearing their conversations and, you know, all the media outlets that were calling her and trying to do interviews. And it was kind of cool just being a fly on the wall um, for such a freaking rock star. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> Anybody that. else? Our, uh, we ended up staying at this place in the city that was really great. It was like a little cabin almost. Um, but the people that we shared the little cabin next to was LA Salt House's parents. Oh, and nice. so we sat on the balcony every night for four nights and like him, her, her dad and my husband were drinking and they were just, <laughs> it was so cool. He's telling stories about like what she had for dinner and he's like, that's what she has for dinner. And then I, he, they were tracking me on the tracker. So when I got home or back to the thing, they were like, you did so great. And I'm like, you were paying <laughs> attention. And, uh, they were talking, they, Paul told them I slipped and they said that Ellie had slipped at the top of the ramp. Um, they said there were two pro women who got to the top and it was kind of slick and they slipped and they said Ellie tumbled down the bottom side of the ramp and her glasses went flying. So that was cool just to see. And they were talking about uh, they had dinner with Christian Blumenfeld the night before the PTO. And so that was really cool just to they're just like normal people. I mean, I know that we know that, but it, it's the same thing, right? She was stressed because something happened with her bike and 
he like all these things. And so that was a, that was a really cool element to the race that I think really played into the week of, of us being there. That was really cool. Awesome. And you got a Daniela reef. Yes. She's so tall. I mean, I'm pretty short, but I thought she was going to be really small. Like me too. She's not. So yeah, (laughs) she signed my bib. Oh, that's nice. Well, this has been uh, so fantastic. So great for you folks to, to jump on. I, I don't know if you know what time zone you're in right now and, and where you are with uh, recovering, uh, but you're, you've been so generous with getting on. And you represented the club fantastic. How about that? We were the sixth in North America in terms of, of qualifiers for that race. Our, our little Las Vegas triathlon club is on the map there. So uh, thank you. I think we were top 50 as far as... Uh overall points too that's all that is amazing what was there 1200 uh clubs represented so uh yeah. that is just fantastic that was really really amazing it was a lot of fun tracking you uh i love the challenges that you overcame and uh we wish we were there celebrating with you but it's it's so good to to uh to catch up with you now and i'm just gonna once again thank you all for coming on and and admit that i didn't track anybody because it was like midnight and but in the morning when I woke up first thing I did was open up my my computer or my iPad and, and look at everybody but I did not track it live I gotta I'm just gonna be completely honest with you that was a little bit too much for me my insomnia I kept waking up and checking in on everybody <laughs> <laughs> awesome. hey, congratulations everyone and thanks, thanks guys for tuning in